The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Why did the Apostle Paul seem to have such a defeated experience in Romans chapter 7? And have you ever thought of what it's going to be like when we get our resurrected, glorified bodies? This is Grace in Focus, and we're glad you're here today. Grace in Focus is the radio broadcast and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. Now, if you want to know more about us, you can find us at faithalone.org. We produce a daily blog, and then Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you can find our videos on the Grace Evangelical Society's YouTube channel. Once again, our website, faithalone.org. Now let's get into our question and answer discussion for today. Here are Bob Wilkin and Dave Renfro. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you. And Renfro is actually a Scottish name. There's actually a place called Renfro, which is a suburb of Chicago, isn't it? No. What You missed it by a few thousand miles. Where is it a suburb of? Suburb of Glasgow, Scotland. Glasgow, okay. Or so Glasgow. I've got a lot of Scottish blood in me. You do, all right. Well, don't you have a question for us there, Dave, from one of our listeners? Yeah. Uh, Stephen has a question. How can the resurrection body be spiritual and be a flesh and bone? Also, will the new body have blood? That's a good question. I believe he's referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says it's a spiritual body. Mm -hmm. I think the answer would be that in this life, we separate the body, the soul, and the spirit, but as total people, we can either be spiritual people or carnal people, mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians two fourteen to 3, 3. But in the life to come, we're all going to be spiritual people. We're all going to be spiritually minded. In fact, we're going to be sinless. We won't sin anymore once we have this glorified body. So it's a spiritual body in the sense that the body is now not competing against the spirit. Is it still flesh and blood? That's the other part he asks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's even suggested, I think, in Revelation 22. It says the uh, leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. It may suggest that there will be people who need healing in the eternal kingdom. We'll be there in glorified bodies, but there will be people there in natural bodies. But we in glorified bodies, yes, we'll be able to bleed and we would be able to theoretically suffer injuries, but if we did, there would be no pain, no suffering, and there'd be instant healing. It's kind of like, you know, all these old cartoons where Wile E. Coyote is is, uh, running after the roadrunner and he runs off the cliff and goes, and And then he runs away. (laughs) And he gets up and runs away. So in any regard, yes, there will be uh, flesh and blood, but it'll be glorified flesh and blood. Read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, where Paul says that we're in this tent, but we have a new home we're going to get. And he's talking about our glorified bodies. And he said, right now we groan in these bodies, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Mm -hmm. and 4, but we're looking forward to a body in which there'll be no more groaning. Well, where I'm coming from on this is even in the millennial kingdom, when Jesus is on the throne... If you go back to Genesis in the fall, he said, cursed be the ground because of you, meaning nature was also cursed. Exactly. And even the millennial kingdom will be on this cursed earth for that thousand year reign, meaning things can happen, but that'll occur until the new heaven and new earth later on in Revelation. Now, you make a good point, and we're going a little aside here, but we who are in glorified bodies on that earth are not going to experience pain and suffering because we're going to be glorified. However, there will be people in natural bodies Mm -hmm. and they will experience limited pain and suffering. But one of the things I'd like to point out regarding your comment is, then this is a guess here, but in Isaiah 65, which seems to be talking about the millennium, Mm -hmm. it's called the new heaven and the new earth there, but it seems like it's talking about the millennium because verse 20 says they will be like trees in terms of their long lives. And, of course, trees Mm -hmm. can live thousands of years. Right. And so it appears that during the millennium, people are going to be living like people lived before the flood. So there will be people that are eight, nine hundred years old. 
They were born in the first century of the millennium, and they're still alive at the end of the millennium. Right. So it's it's like, yes, the world was cursed after the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, but there was a bigger curse that occurred when the flood happened, because now life expectancy drops tenfold. Right. And so something happened. We aren't told exactly what that is, and it's not exactly called a curse, but it clearly is it's some a, kind of a It's a consequence curse. of sin that was going on back then and, and right. the, the consequence of that incredible judgment that the Lord imposed upon the earth right. during the flood. So my point is people in natural bodies during the millennium are going to have a much better experience than we do in this life. That's true. They're going to live 10 times longer. Of course, they're going to be living in a righteous kingdom and a kingdom of peace. Jesus is not going to tolerate open rebellion. Or wars between countries. There's you know, not going to be wars, and, and there's going to be widespread compliance to the teachings of Jesus. Right. It doesn't mean everybody will be believers, but it means even the unbelievers are going to be people who are fearful of rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ because they know the consequences will exactly. be swift. Yeah. It's coming. It'll be here before you know it. What am I talking about? The Grace Evangelical Society's National Conference 2024. It will take place May the 20th through the 23rd at Camp Copus, an absolutely beautiful campground in North Texas, right on the lake with lots of recreation, great food, a great place to stay, wonderful fellowship, and wonderful free grace Bible teaching. Information and online registration now at faithalone.org slash events. Come and join us, faithalone.org slash events. All right, well, let's see. We've got time for a second question. Do you have another question there, David? Yeah, a um, guy named Gary, he said, I have questions regarding Romans 7. He says, was Paul speaking of his struggle in keeping God's law before coming to faith or after? Secondly, was he speaking of himself or a hypothetical person? And third, reason being, in other books, I believe in Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians to imitate him. Why would he do that if in Romans he is struggling? Okay, that's those are all good questions. And you say it's from Gary? From Gary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Indiana... Uh, that, that's right, yeah, the, 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 the thriving Indiana. metropolis, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So in Romans chapter 7, there's a big discussion, and Gary points out that this is a, a big question here. When Paul talks about the law and what it happened to, to him, he says, uh, I was alive once without the law, but when, this is verse 9, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and good and just. And he goes on to say that, for example, in verse 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present in me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. And so what Paul's talking about here is a struggle. And some people think this is an ongoing struggle for every Christian. Mm -hmm. I don't hold that view. My view is this is talking about Paul after his new birth— but early in his Christian life, hmm. it appears when you read the book of Acts that initially when he came to faith on the road to Damascus and, and then went to Damascus and received his sight back and the forgiveness of sins, initially he was on fire for the Lord. Hmm. He was evangelizing the uh, Jewish people there and uh, he was promoting the faith he was sent there to try to destroy and he was then let down in a basket, and he went to Jerusalem, and there he was boldly proclaiming Christ as well. But at some point, somebody uh, influenced him to begin to look to the law for his sanctification, the law of Moses. 
And he took his eyes off Christ and started looking at the commandments. And what he says in Romans 7 is when I focused on the commandments, instead of it causing me to live righteously, it caused me to sin. Mm -hmm. I do not believe this is the ongoing experience that Paul had or the ongoing experience of any spiritually minded believer. This is the experience of a baby Christian when they are deceived into thinking that what I need to do is keep a list of do's and don'ts and Mm -hmm. focus on those, Mm -hmm. and that is defeating. So what were Gary's three questions? He wanted to know, was this Paul as a believer? Yes, but not his entire Christian life. This was at some point early in the Christian life. In his early Christian life, And what were his other two questions? Well, he said, was Paul speaking of his struggle in keeping God's law before coming to faith or after? After. I think it's after. Was he speaking of himself or hypothetical person? Himself. I think he was, yeah. And number three, reason being in other books, I believe Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians to imitate him. Why would he do that if in Romans he's struggling? Well, because he wasn't struggling in Romans. He was talking in this one chapter of Romans, which is the sanctification section, that there was a time early in his Christian life when he was confused. But when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he's talking about himself as a spiritual person. Remember, he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, we have the mind of Christ. We meaning spiritually minded believers. Mm -hmm. And so Paul is an example of a spiritually minded believer, and he wants people to follow him in that regard. Paul's not claiming sinless in this mind, you know, but what he is claiming is that he is walking in the spirit and he is spiritually minded. And so in Romans chapter seven, basically what Paul is saying is there was a time when I focused on the commandments instead of the commander, instead of Christ. And that got me off. And that is a danger for any Christian. Of we course, need, we need, or to be polluted by any kind of teaching, maybe yeah. from the world or whatever. Yeah, and keep in mind how Romans 7 ends. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Right. Well, he opens into chapter 8. It's going to be the Lord Jesus through the power of the Spirit. Exactly. And he goes on to say that to be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. Right. So Romans 7 is not the end of the sanctification section. No, it's not. It opens up into chapter 8. I agree. All right. Well, thanks so much, y'all. And remember, keep Keep grace grace in in focus. Be sure to check out our daily blogs at faithalone.org. They are short and full of great teaching, just like what you've heard today. Find them at faithalone.org slash resources slash blog. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you've got a question, comment, or some feedback. If you do, please don't hesitate to send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. And when you do, very important, please let us know your radio station call letters and the city of your location. On our next episode, an in-depth look at Romans 10, 9, and 10. And until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.